pada tahun 1970, hampir separuh penduduk di Semenanjung Malaysia hidup dalam kemiskinan. Kebanyakannya, orang bumi putera. Menjelang tahun 2014, berikutan pengenalan dasar ekonomi baru iaitu DEB, jumlah tersebut menurun ke 0.6%. Sekurang-kurangnya, itulah naratif rasminya. DEB ialah satu polisi tindakan afirmatif yang dilaksanakan untuk memperbaiki kedudukan bumi putera dalam ekonomi negara. Tetapi, berjaya ke dasar ini? Selepas 40 tahun, adakah orang bumi putera kini lebih berdaya saing berbanding pada tahun 1970? Most of Malaysia's approximately 10 million people live on the narrow coastal plains near the sea. Many of the people in West Malaysia, the Malay Peninsula, work as fishermen or as traders. Pada zaman penjajahan British, strategi pecah dan perintah digunakan untuk mengawal rakyat dan ekonomi Melaya. Orang Cina diberi peluang dalam bidang pelombongan dan perdagangan. Orang India pula menjadi buruh paksa dalam sektor pertanian dan orang Melayu dibiar menetap sekitar kampung pendalaman berjauhan dari kepesatan ekonomi di bandar. The British were worried if they allow the Malays to come up in the economy, they can displace the British within key economic sectors. As far as the Indians and the Chinese were concerned, the British can always send them back to India and China. But you could not do that with the Malays. So while Malays had an interest in key sectors like tin mining for a long time, plantations, they were slowly displaced from those sectors. From 1957 to 1969, not much had been done by the government to really bring about major structural changes to rectify these problems that had been perpetrated during colonial rule. One reason for that was when the Alliance government and UNO achieved independence, they had a tacit agreement with the British that there would not be any nationalization of these companies. Menjelang tahun 1969, 62% ekonomi negara terkawal daripada perusahaan asing dan kebanyakannya daripada Britain. Orang Cina memiliki 22.8%, sementara orang bumi putera pula hanya memegang 1.5% walaupun mereka merupakan penduduk majoriti. Jurang ekonomi ini menimbulkan ketegangan antara hubungan orang Melayu dengan orang Cina. Ketegangan ini terus memuncak pada tahun 1963. Berikutan penyertaan Singapura membentuk negara Malaysia yang turut membawa bilang populasi Cina yang ramai. Belata belakangan inilah tercetusnya insiden rusuhan kaum di Singapura pada tahun 1964 dan menjadi antara punca mengapa berlakunya perpisahan antara kedua-dua puan negara tersebut pada tahun 1965. Tidak lama selepas itu, keganasan yang sama berlaku di Malaysia pula. Rusuhan 13 Mei 1969 menjadi detik terburuk keganasan antara kaum di Malaysia. Menurut sumber rasmi, sebanyak 196 orang terkorban. Menurut sumber lain yang menganggarkan bahawa jumlah terkorban sebenarnya menghampiri 600 orang. Ramai di antaranya orang Cina. Inilah satu sebabnya dasar ekonomi baru diperkenalkan pada tahun 1971 sebagai tindakan afirmatif untuk mengurangkan jurang ekonomi dan memperbaiki hubungan antara kaum. Dasar tindakan afirmatif bertujuan untuk memberi peluang kepada masyarakat yang kurang bernasib baik. Sekitar 10 tahun sebelum DEP diperkenalkan, di Amerika Syarikat, Presiden John F. Kennedy menandatangani perintah eksekutif yang mewajibkan kontraktor kerajaan memberi peluang kerja sama rata untuk kaum minoriti dan wanita. Di India pula, terdapat sistem reservation. Komuniti-komuniti yang kehidupannya terjejas berikutan pemisahan kaum, kasta dan agama oleh penjajah diberi tempat khas dalam sistem persekolahan, pekerjaan dan politik. Serupa di Malaysia, pembetulan jurang ekonomi yang diwujudkan penjajah merupakan antara matlamat utama dasar ekonomi baru. The British continue to have enormous ownership and control of the corporate sector. This is what the NEP wanted to change. Public enterprises were created and then a lot of money was invested in them and they were used to go and acquire assets, particularly from foreigners who own a huge interest in the economy and then redistribute it to the poor 
today we refer to them as government killing companies or GLCs. Apabila DEB berakhir pada tahun 1991, kadar kemiskinan negara telah menurun ke 16.5%. Kadar kemiskinan warga Bumi Putera pula jatuh ke 17.5% dan terus menurun pada tahun-tahun berikutnya. Dasar tindakan afirmatif di Malaysia diluaskan untuk merangkumi bidang pendidikan dan berjaya mewujudkan kelas pertengahan Melayu baru. Meskipun begitu, semakin ramai kian bimbang terhadap ketidaksamaan yang meningkat di kalangan warga bukan Melayu. Despite the advantages or the positive sides of the NEP, we also cannot overlook the downside. NEP was established mainly to cater the Malay's resentment of being left out from the country's development progress, right? So in doing that, it actually overlooked the other ethnic minorities' interests and economic disparity, such as the Indian minorities. There were less attention that were given to other social cleavages in society, such as intra-ethnic poverty, gender gap, or generation gap. Another downside of the NEP is that it has enabled some practices uh, that is closely associated with abuse of power and corruption, such as rent-seeking and cronyism. It ignores merits and it demotivates capable individuals, companies from contributing to the country. It has created a group of people who are over-dependent who rely solely on their ethnic identity to be given the share of the pie. It's meant to promote participation, representation, but I think ultimately what it needs to do is to build the capability, right, and the confidence of the beneficiaries. And this is where I think where Affirmative Action Malaysia has fallen short. It's done well in providing access, in providing opportunity. Malaysia, you know, didn't really do that you know, second part of it, or the capability development, right, and competitiveness up to uh, the level I think that, that was necessary. They got sidetracked towards the acquisition and profiteering. Semasa tahun 1980-an, perubahan dasar yang mengutamakan penswastaan telah secara tidak langsung mewujudkan golongan elit. Beberapa pakar sains sosial dan ekonomi berpendapat bahawa waktu inilah jurang ekonomi di kalangan orang Melayu sendiri semakin membesar. There was a shift here now from redistributing wealth to creating corporate captains who were key actors in the economy. The assets that were acquired by the public enterprises were then privatized to a select group of Malay businessmen. A new corporate elite was created by 1997. Walaupun belum terdapat banyak kajian penyelidikan tentang jurang ekonomi dalam kalangan orang Melayu, namun terdapat data yang menunjukkan fenomena ini berlaku. Berdasarkan laporan tahunan Amanah Saham Bumi Putera 2019, 70% daripada jumlah dana tersebut dimiliki hanya 9% pemegang ASB. Dari segi perusahaan pula, 88% PKS Bumi Putera dikelaskan sebagai perusahaan mikro dan hanya 1% merupakan perusahaan bersaiz sederhana. Manakala 69% PKS bukan Bumi Putera bersaiz mikro. 28% bersaiz kecil dan 3% bersaiz sederhana. Jadi, bagaimana kita boleh laksanakan tindakan afirmatif dengan lebih baik? Pada tahun 2019, Presiden PKR Anwar Ibrahim menyeru untuk menghentikan dasar berlandaskan kaum kerana ianya idea yang lapuk dan negara kita perlukan pendekatan yang lebih holistik untuk membantu orang miskin. Jalan ke hadapan memerlukan pendekatan berlandaskan keperluan di mana bantuan diberi mengikut kedudukan sosioekonomi seseorang. Contohnya, tindakan afirmatif boleh difokuskan kepada golongan B40 tanpa mengira kaum atau bangsa. Need-based affirmative action is not about giving 500 ringgit uh, bantuan. Okay, need-based affirmative action is trying to achieve upward mobility into university, right, uh, employment, participation in business uh, and so on. But we need to also find ways to help the beneficiaries graduate out of assistance. And that comes from a systematic, you know, and critical approach, right? And looking for actual solutions. Tapi, setiap kali ada tuntutan untuk mereformasikan dasar tindakan afirmatif, mulalah kecoh semula. Bolehkah perubahan ini berlaku di Malaysia? That's the consequence of that era of thinking that it only benefits an elite. Which is so false because it really delivers opportunity to millions of households. You know, the spirit of these times, right, we talk so much about empathy. I think it really needs to apply here, to hear the other side, for the minorities to really empathize 
that there is apprehension among the majority, you know, when people talk about need-based affirmative action, when you talk about replacing race-based affirmative action. People are, you know, are very rational to feel that there might be a threat to their opportunity. We have to move on by finding ways to, to find new compromises rather than just stake out your position and then get into a polarization and a stalemate.